you know, people were still learning their, their way and you'd get these things and say, uh, professor, you know, you were, we're not seeing your slides or, um, you know, I, I did a sort of opening thing where I, I said, I'm showing them some notes and I said, okay, I want everybody to try to solve this problem. And somebody, professor, you're showing your notes at the bottom with the answer in, okay, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, or I'll be lecturing and uh, they're mowing the lawn outside or you know, various other things. So uh, the one thing I learned to do for sure was to make sure I didn't have my email open uh, before. I was <laughs> That's a good thing. Well, I think we're, we're just about at the appointed hour, uh, actually a, a few seconds past. So let me open us with a prayer and, um, and I'll welcome everybody and we'll get started. So let's pray. I thank you for this time that we are together with one another, not quite the way we're accustomed to, but Lord, as um, challenging and sometimes as frustrating as technology can be, we thank you for this technology. Some years ago, we wouldn't even be able to do this. Um, so we are grateful uh, for this opportunity. Thank you for Jeff being with us today. Thank you for everyone who is uh, tuning in to this Zoom webinar. Help us to learn about faith and to grow out our own. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So just a, a couple things. Um, there is a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions for Jeff, you can put them there. And Pastor Lynn will be uh, taking those uh, questions. And uh, occasionally throughout what we're doing today, she will um, share them and ask them. Uh, so uh, Jeff will get a chance to uh, respond to those as well as my questions. Um, we will have a hard stop at 11 o'clock because we have an 11.15 service to get to. So we must stop at 11. We'll try to actually stop a few minutes before 11, but whether we're done or not, we're getting cut off at 11 o'clock. So um, I bet you wish you could do that with me on uh, uh, Sunday sermons and such. But anyway, that's how it's working. So a uh, welcome um, on this first new endeavor of a, a summer uh, series for faith formation, all about uh, our professors and authors within the congregation. You've heard of professions of faith. We're calling them professors of faith. Um, many of you, if you don't know uh, Jeff Popiak, you have seen him. He sings in the choir up front when we're together uh, in the tenor section every week. He's been a youth choir director for many years. Uh, that drew to a close in 2015 when, when his son Matt uh, went to college. He's been a part of the, our web team uh, and a friend to many of you, and a professor to a whole lot more uh, students or at Drexel University. So um, thank you, Jeff, for being here with us this morning. And would you just give us a little bit of, of uh, inside information on uh, your life growing up and your family growing up, and then we'll get into more uh, and other things a little later. Just start with that for us so we can get to know you a little. Okay, I, um, I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, I do have some, some slides. And we're going to make sure that they show up. Uh, actually, so this is, uh, actually, that's something I saw when I was on vacation a couple of years ago. And I, I don't, as I told Gary, I, I'm uh, usually a lot uh, more able to talk about things uh, that are the subjects I teach rather than myself. But I dug through and I found some uh, bio slides uh, when I gave a, a talk to a student group a few years ago. So I kind of updated them. I'll just go through them quickly. Um, you know, so they want to know who I am. And oh, by the way, I'm lecturing to you live today from Drexel's newest <laughs> lecture hall, Popiak Hall. Uh, I delivered 40-some uh, lectures uh, this spring term uh, from, from this, uh, the ivory basement uh, here at Drexel. And so um, I, this is uh, the setup I'm uh, talking to you from. As you can see, I've decided, and rather than sharing my actual background uh, with the students, uh, you know, with bookshelves and all that stuff, I've just gone with the wall behind me, which I figure is enough of a personal glimpse for, for them. The, um, this is a kind of merit badge sash of some of the things that I've been involved in, uh, mm. which I have used as an overview slide, but uh, I'll just, just sort of delve into, into those. I, I, um, I grew up in, in Virginia. My formative years were really the 1960s. 
Uh, I, uh, let's see, my, my father was a correctional officer. My mother did a lot of different things, but probably the thing that she would uh, resonate the most with of her entire career was teaching kindergarten. And she, uh, and she was also, uh, she didn't go to college. So when mm. kindergarten became mandatory in Virginia, uh, she wasn't able to be a teacher anymore, but she stayed on as a, a, a teacher's aide for many years. Um, I went to George Mason University, which was in nearby Fairfax, Virginia, about 10 miles from where I grew up at the bridge. And, uh, and, and one of the, if you take a look at some of the, if I take a look at the whole arc of my life and say, where are the things that really went off in a really different direction? The idea that I would actually get a varsity letter in a sport in college was, would be completely uh, the one thing that nobody would ever match me up with that I went to high school with. So uh, that was kind of uh, different. Uh, I went, went to graduate school at the University of Virginia. By the way, I studied mathematics at George Mason and, and studied applied mathematics at, at UVA. And I was in a department of applied math and computer science. And if I'd realized it was possible for me to major in computer science without an undergraduate degree in computer science, which actually weren't all that plentiful in those days, mm -hmm. I probably would have majored in CS. But as it was, I uh, pretty much was uh, had beat in both camps, and uh, the CS stuff I teach tends to be a lot more mathematical than uh, than I think the average uh, computer science class. Um, I had a, a one year postdoc out in Washington State, and if you want to take a look at another place where my life really went off in a different direction, everything up till that point had been within like a hundred miles of the place where I, I was born. And uh, then Washington State University is 2,800 miles away. Spending uh, basically nine months out there was a uh, uh, was quite different. I, I really uh, the social climate out there was so very much different from where I grew up in Virginia. Uh, but I did uh, meet the love of my life there, so I think it was a, a nine months uh, incredibly well spent. After which I uh, returned back to Drexel, which is you know 150 miles from where I grew up. So. Uh, as you can see, I don't really move around a lot, but I guess I made it pay off when I did. Um, and yes, well, you know, Renee, uh, the, the reason for this picture, this is uh, taken in 1982. And just to show you that one of us changed a lot, <laughs> and I'm not going to name any names, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, she, well, I, I just say she's uh, incredibly youthful. And uh, we have, of course, uh, say our daughter, Lauren, uh, many of you know from, uh, was born in 87. Uh, then Nick, a couple years later, and Matt in 96. And uh, he's the one with the, uh, the well, no. Anyway, uh, th these are just some pictures of them growing up. We like to say that uh, Renee had a, a twin daughter. And um, it's, it does, there is quite a resemblance there. Uh, that's our cat, Misty, that Nick's holding. Uh, we joined uh, Grove in 87. Um, we moved here in 86. Uh, some of the things I've done as a member of Grove, I was on the administrative board as a member at large for, for many years. Um, I uh, was on the nomination staff. I think I served two uh, stints on that, uh, mm -hmm. which was quite, quite a, a big time uh, committee when, uh, when Alan Brown was the pastor here. Um, he, he liked to have all of next year's appointments ready in January. Uh, so uh, with plenty of time to change afterwards, which was a really completely different foreign concept to everybody else, I think, on the committee. <laughs> the, um, uh, I was on a pastor staff parish. One of the things I, I learned uh, as a member of nominations was that they also knew very well whose terms were expiring on every committee and which committees were going to need somebody a year from then. And so uh, I, I realized when I was coming off nominations that I was going to be the subject to one of those meetings. And sure enough, <laughs> I ended up on Pastor Staff Parish. Uh, and I joined in um, January of, of 2001. And four days later, Alan uh, announced his retirement. <laughs> so that was a very, very busy year for us. Um, and a few years, I should say. Uh, the, the thing I've, I've done, which has been uh, the most favorite uh, as was has been a, as a youth leader uh, since, uh, and uh, as you can see, 20, uh, 2003 to 2015, uh, just some of the, uh, the, the things that I found uh, really were, were life-changing for me. 
uh, were first of all going on choir tour in 2001 and 2002 at the request of my daughter. And uh, it, it sounded to me like a really bad idea. Uh, but as Renee pointed out to me, uh, if my teenage daughter was asking for me to do something as part of her life, uh, that, that was something I should really be paying attention to. And it didn't take much reflection to realize she was exactly right. Uh, what I didn't know was going to happen was how, um, how much I would really, uh, I guess, um, just feel like I was really a, a good part of, of something really good and, uh, and how close I, I became to the, the youth and the youth leaders here and uh, went on a few more choir tours. And it, it, was, it was quite a great thing. Um, and yes, I've, I've been on the, uh, uh, the web team uh, for I'm not sure how many years now. Uh, Tabernacle Choir, um, probably about eight years or so, and I've been on the volleyball team. Okay, oh, yes, our, our daughter and her husband got married here at Grove, and uh, then I have to show you this. My daughter is an engineer, so is her husband. Uh, only she would think it was okay to be walking around in her wedding dress with a backpack on. The, um, uh, oh yeah, we have pets. Uh, Chase here, uh, our, our uh, puggle, uh, was actually some uh, a puppy that came back from ASP trip uh, in 2008 that Grove uh, went on. They brought back uh, these three puppies that were rescues, and uh, and we've still we still have them. He's 12 years old now. And uh, Pepper and Mookie, uh, who have since gone on, actually, the, I kept the picture of Pepper in here just as a warning to people: you really should never ever let anybody look over your shoulder when you're typing your password in. Um, Oh yeah, so this is, uh, I guess, 2015. This is not Matt with his pregnant prom date. It's actually his sister, uh, and this is the, the introduction. So then we now have granddaughters. And so uh, this is Mabel, uh, who, by the way, she's four years old now and wears a dress all the time. And we aren't sure where that gene came from because uh, it was sort of the opposite of her mother wearing a wedding dress with a backpack on. She doesn't think there's anything wrong with going out in the woods uh, or on a hike or anything wearing a nice dress. Uh, and now we have Flora too, who's uh, just uh, celebrated her first birthday. And uh, as you can see, uh, really <laughs> celebrated her first birthday. She likes, uh, actually, this, uh, don't try this at home, kids. You really shouldn't be standing. Uh, she's light enough to away with it. And I think that may have been the, uh, possibly not the way they cleaned off her uh, after her birthday party. But anyway, um, what I've been doing at Drexel, I, uh, I've been involved with a lot of student activities. I've always liked working with students. And I guess that also sort of, like, by the way, you said I was a, a Drexel youth choir director, but I wasn't. I was a youth, uh, youth leader. The, uh, but I've, I've been involved with a, a lot of, uh, of student activities for a while. I just have this one on the end, Ducks Teach, uh, Drexel University Computer Science Teachers that these students uh, wanted to be able to work uh, with teachers at schools in Philadelphia, and we were able to help them uh, do that. Also, the one above that, the Women in Computing Society. At one point, when I was in our front office, uh, uh, the, uh, the advisor for, for the Women in Computing Society, which is a pretty new group, had left, and then there weren't any female faculty uh, besides her, actually full-time uh, female faculty, I should say, and they came to me and said, we need somebody to sign our form and say they'll be their advisor, but we'll get, and I said, no. My damsel in distress uh, reaction kicked in, and I said, I'll be your advisor, don't worry, and, and I'll help you find <laughs> somebody uh, who may be better qualified for it along the way, but uh, both of those uh, have been really great uh, experience. I did that for a few years and now we have a whole bunch of, of uh, women faculty and so I'm glad that that group was able to sustain through that uh, period. Um, and I've been uh, involved uh, more recently with uh, working with teachers in the school district and, and also in, in suburbs in uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and, the, uh, and with a middle sc uh, school robotics camp uh, for middle school girls. And finally, uh, the Philadelphia STEM Ecosystem Computer Science Work Group is a group of uh, about 40 to 50 professionals in the area that are all working to help uh, with uh, uh, equity in the computer science education in Philadelphia. And those are the classes I've, I've taught, uh, computer science principles, computer programming one and two, 
artificial intelligence and various uh, AI related uh, courses. And uh, one that I've uh, had the pleasure of teaching a couple times with a music professor uh, colleague in computational music. And uh, these are just some things about uh, those. Uh, I'll, I'll skip those. Uh, but actually, so I Jeff, do, yes. can we just uh, pause for a minute? And uh, I want to see if we have any questions uh, for those who are watching. I see we're up to 39 participants. Wow, Jeff, you a crowd. Um, so I'm, uh, Pastor Lynn is in the room with me. She is definitely more than six feet away, and she's looking at your chat questions. Pastor Lynn, are there any that uh, you would like to share with us this morning? So I uh, just have a really interesting question, except that the Bible does not say that the Holy Spirit like to know on behalf of Tom Tollison, is this computer science 101? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you want to? Yeah, I, I said that you should see me after class. So uh, this uh, uh, actually, I will tell talk about CS 101. The, uh, the traditional approach to teaching uh, computer science starts, you really need to know how to program. And so it's usually been uh, day one, you start programming right away. And we found, uh, as, as teachers did all over the, the country, that uh, some people had this big, they'd never seen anything like it before. They signed up for computer science because they thought it would be a great thing. Uh, they didn't know anything about programming. And two weeks into it, you're telling them, oh, you need semicolons here and angle brackets and quote signs. Oh, no, those double quotes, not single quotes. And oh, don't forget to indent properly. And, 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 and their heads were swimming. They, they couldn't imagine what this had to do with anything. It didn't sound like what they wanted to do for a career. And so uh, in uh, 2008, I guess it was a, um, a reaction to uh, the fact that actually computer science enrollments were down a lot and people weren't taking the uh, AP programming exams as much, and especially the second one, they just stopped offering at ETS, uh, the college board stopped offering that. And there was this uh, momentary outrage, uh, how could they do this without really, you know, canvassing the, the group? And then uh, immediately uh, people said, well, why don't we work on what we think really should be done here, which is offer uh, an introduction to computer science that's accessible to everybody, not just people who want to major in computer science, not just uh, the, the very narrow demographic that wants to enter computer science, and, and really relates uh, computational thinking to uh, all other subjects and in the world. And so uh, that uh, was the birth of computer science principles. And I was lucky enough to be on uh, the uh, pilot two team, I think from 2013 to 2016, when the uh, exam finally launched. And uh, a class that we'd been offering at Drexel since 97 uh, was a pilot course for, for this. But it really has to do with how, does, how do computers uh, impact society? Um, how, how does, uh, and, and I guess, what are the major things that you can do with, with computing as opposed to sit down and learn to program right from here? You do learn some programming along the way and you have to create some artifacts for the, uh, um, the AP exam. But what this has done is it's really opened it up and the, uh, uh, the, the number of minority students around the country that, uh, that signed up uh, for these courses in the first year uh, was like an order of magnitude higher than, than ever we're signing up for computer science uh, 101, you know, typical programming one classes. So, so that was a really good uh, loaded question from Tom. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tom, for, or Kathy, for asking it. So I, I want to move into uh, three areas of your professional life that really do um, reflect um, your faith. Uh, and I'll, I'll do these individually, but I just want to give uh, the people who are listening in, who are participating, uh, set up what these are. You've, uh, Jeff has done some fabulous work with um, urban middle school girls for a robotics camp. He's had a, a project with the uh, Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. And he's also um, an expert in um, artificial intelligence and ethics. What an interface. So um, we'll, we'll talk about all three. Jeff, would you start with the, the middle school um, girls and down from in Philadelphia and the robotics camp that you do with them? Could you spend, you know, two or three, four minutes talking about that? Sure. The, uh, I'm going to 
in those, although I do actually have some slides about, <laughs> I didn't necessarily intend to, to uh, be doing the whole thing with slides, but uh, I do, th this is uh, the other thing uh, that I do. Robot Springboard at Drexel was, um, was I guess, founded as uh, via the National uh, Center for Women and in Information Technology offer these Aspirations in Computing Awards for uh, for middle school, middle school, well, high school girls and college girls, uh, young la ladies who uh, are passionate about computing and want to, uh, you know, do something uh, with it and further it. And they uh, they offered a chance to uh, do middle school outreach for any girls who'd won a sort of a national or regional recognition. Uh, so I know, you know, I, I was a judge for, for the first run of those, and I, I'd be glad to help uh, in any of these. The girls had to work with a college partner because there was some funding coming with it, and they just couldn't imagine sending 3000 bucks to some high school girls and saying, yeah, your plan sounds good. So they wanted a fiscal agent handling all this. But uh, I got involved, and I was so lucky because um, these two young ladies from the Baldwin School uh, in uh, Bryn Mawr, who are 10th graders, uh, just have this passion for robotics. They were involved in uh, VEX Robotics and FIRST Robotics, and the, the leaders of them were always telling them, you have to go out and, uh, and, and really bring these uh, ideas to uh, underserved areas. And they, uh, they, they were ecstatic at the chance to work with somebody in Philadelphia to do this. And uh, they even, uh, they had convinced their parents to, to take them out to Alaska. They found some people in Homer, Alaska, uh, which is a really small little town uh, on, on a bay out there. And uh, where they said, yeah, we don't have anything about uh, <laughs> robotics education here, but we'll let you offer this as part of a, a you know, one week summer thing. And so they, they were all planned. They were going out there. And then they got this email from this lady who was so apologetic. She said, our town council just canceled uh, summer programs. And, you know, I, I, they, they were devastated. They said, you know, we already have our plane tickets and everything. We've got this plan. And I read the letter from this, this lady and I said, you know what? I said, you have convinced her as strongly as you convinced me that you were really on the ball and that you're worth the extra mile. And sure enough, this lady, I said, just hang in there and, and keep, uh, keep the faith. And she she found somebody, she found, I guess the county was willing to come in and offer something in their facility. And these young ladies went out there and they offered this and NPR interviewed them when they were out there. It was really great. So by the time they showed up uh, for us in, in uh, August to be able to offer this, they were celebrities already. Uh, they, and, and they started doing this and, and they are, they, it's great. They convinced uh, people at Intel to, they said, oh, you know, Intel, you have a place down in Costa Rica. We'd like to go to Costa Rica and, and offer this camp down there. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, wow. And so the next thing, you know, they went down there and they said, oh, by the way, these kids all speak Spanish. That's okay. They made up their, they translated their manuals into Spanish. They went down there. So I've been able to ride on, on these young ladies' coattails. They got a, a shout out uh, from, on Twitter from Arnie Johnson. No, yeah, who was the, uh, Arnie, Arnie Duncan, I'm sorry, who was the Secretary of Education, uh, U.S. Secretary of Education at the time. So uh, with that as, as the, uh, there was, that was, that's a picture of them. And uh, with that as, as the backdrop, I will uh, say that they've been doing, uh, they did this until they graduated from high school, but they were also great at being able to pass the torch. And so we've had other uh, high school girls who uh, have been award winners and so on who've been participating in this and we've gotten uh, students from Drexel to help out with us and uh, and uh, there's just uh, some of the some pictures of some of the things that uh, that we were doing in, in the classroom this is uh, something that this is probably the type of camp that people seriously at, at the University of Pennsylvania is offering things like this and charging people a thousand bucks a week and we were charging 60 plus giving <laughs> Um, uh, fellowships to, or scholarships to anybody, or half scholarships at least to anybody who needed one. So we didn't want the cost to be a barrier to anybody. And it's just been uh, an, an amazing uh, experience for the, the, the young ladies in this always come, come out of it sky high. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's been something we're not offering this year because the, um, because of you know what, uh, the, the, <laughs> 
pandemic, but, uh, but we're still ho hoping to be able to offer something online and just uh, for free. So, so I, Jeff, I think that it's, to me, it's, it's uh, the question that people would have is, you know, how is a, how is a computer science professor, you know, living his, his faith? You know, those two don't seem to go together. Don't you have to be a missionary or a pastor? And you've just explained that to us, you know, taking those basic Christian values and putting them to use um, in a place where there is need and doing so cross-culturally around the world with uh, different uh, pe persons of different socioeconomic classes. Um, I, I hope that everyone who's participating today is, is hearing this and is taking it to heart and maybe passing it on to their own children or grandchildren or for our youth who are listening, you know, seeing this model. Um, again, I'm going to look to Pastor Lynn. Are any, any questions about this particular part of his uh, time with us coming through? Nothing? Nope. They're intently listening and the numbers continue to go up. Wow. Um, so let, let's talk about this, this second uh, project that you've, you've been working on with uh, the, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we, um, uh, the Ducks Teach uh, student group, uh, which uh, started out as kind of interesting. Uh, students are all required to do five uh, hours of, of uh, civic engagement as a freshman. And the idea is if they get them started on doing civic engagement early on uh, as freshmen, they'll really see, see this as part, a regular part of their life. Uh, the reality has been a little bit closer to it. There's just one thing they need to check, another box they need to check off in freshman year, doing something that they'll probably never do again. And, and that's been a, an alarming thing for, for people. So I was teaching an honor section of computer science in 2013. That was a pretty pivotal year. For me and the uh, and and I, I went in and I told them that hey you know what there's 24 of you in this class and they haven't told you the facts of life yet it's only the second week of the fall term but uh, you're going to be required to do five hours of civic engagement and the office of civic engagement has a big list of things you can look at and you can find something that you think would be good to do to help somebody and uh, and yet they're willing to let you do something. If you come up with something good of your own, uh, they're, they're willing to let you do that. Uh, and so think about what you could do with 24 times five, 120 hours collectively of civic engagement. You could really make a difference in something. And they did some brainstorming. And I'm telling you, as they went around the room, people were saying, we, you know, after 10 minutes of brainstorming, you know, we were thinking about like making a video game. Okay, and it was about what? Well, you know, okay, that's good. How about the next group? We were thinking of like a, maybe a video game. Okay, and and just went around the room, and it's like everybody's thinking like, well, they could create video games, and oh, I don't think they're quite getting it. But the last group said, we'd like to go. Uh, we know we have a lot of technological knowledge, and we know that our teachers didn't, or at least a lot of the teachers at our schools didn't, and they, they have real needs. And, and just, they aren't able to teach uh, some of the topics that, that might be really good also in computer science. And we're willing to just work with, with teachers uh, or a school somewhere to, to be able to do this. And well, they, it didn't take too much persuading from that point on. And we were able to uh, get uh, work with, uh, in those days, uh, the um, St. Francis de Sales School in West Philadelphia. and uh, and they, they got this together and they ended up uh, getting uh, a bunch of students to, uh, from outside their uh, 24 also to come and, and do this as part of their civic engagement, uh, got recognized as a student organization, got recognized as the, uh, um, by the civic engagement office and ended up winning an award somewhere along the line, which was great. Then they had all these plans for the next year that uh, they were going to bring in some student groups to school and have special seminars for them. And that was going great gun until, uh, guns until uh, Jerry Sandusky made the headlines and suddenly uh, they're just, <laughs> schools had to pretty much stop bringing minors into to colleges uh, without all sorts of uh, hoops uh, to jump through and, and uh, the certifications or you know, the uh, background clearances and so on. Uh, uh, there just wasn't anybody that everybody said you're going to have to have all these, but uh, there was one of those unfunded mandates. So there wasn't somebody who uh, was willing to pay that. And um, 
And then amazingly, and it was right before I went on, on sabbatical, so I, I had less involvement with this, but the uh, Philadelphia District Attorney's Office got in touch with the group and said, we have uh, like 20 students who are uh, at, at risk for truancy, and we'd really like to show them that something, there's something more interesting, a real reason to go to school and, and to learn things. And we wondered if you could teach them, oh, by the way, coincidentally, the thing they thought they might do is teach them how to build a video game. But uh, the, um, and, and they, they started doing this. And uh, that's what I was, I was on sabbatical, but the, uh, the co-advisor for the group uh, was working with them and things, things were going pretty well. They got their clearances all handled by the, by the city who was willing to pay for it, see. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing is that over uh, the course of uh, the six months or so they were doing this, the attendance uh, started out with 20 kids and it just it dropped steadily. It, it didn't drop for, you know, immediately, but they said once somebody stopped coming, they never came back. And so by the end of the term, I think, or the two terms they did this, they were down to three students and they were pretty discouraged with that. And um, the, uh, the, I, I told them, well, you know what, to me though, it sounds like you got 15% of these kids to really, really, uh, really get an, interested in this. And I think anybody anywhere would be very pleased with that as a percentage for this at-risk group. And so uh, it's nowhere near what we had hoped for, but it, it's really something great. Uh, they were uh, supposed to get a citation from the district attorney. Unfortunately, the district attorney got his own citation <laughs> and uh, we uh, did not end up uh, involved with the newer one. So uh, that, uh, anyway, that, that sort of uh, was that, but uh, that, that group, uh, they're still looking to, uh, uh, those students have gone on and graduated, but uh, there's still some interest in, in doing that with the newer group. Well, thank you, that, that really does fit perfectly with today, you know, for United Methodists, it's Peace with Justice Sunday. And um, I know uh, Deacon Marilyn is, 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 is around today. She was uh, assisting at table um, with communion. I don't know if she's listening now, but this sounds like something, you know, right, right uh, down her street with uh, restorative justice and, um, you know, working with, with persons who are at risk um, to, to, to go on to something better. So again, how you've um, parlayed your um, skills and your faith into, into helping other people. Uh, looking to uh, Pastor Lynn, anything from, from folks? You're shaking your head yes? Sure, read the comment. So uh, Sid says, Jeff forgot to add to his list of Grove activities and offices, head cheerleader. He's always eager to provide encouragement to those of us bungling our way through various areas of ministry at Grove. Thank you, Pastor Lennon. Thank you, Sid, for, for sharing that. Brought a smile to Jeff's face as well. Um, something else you may not know about Jeff, and this is where we're going to then move into, is uh, uh, Jeff shared the, the cover, the cover story. He shared the cover of the Philadelphia Business Journal with none other than Brad Pitt. So, um, you know, that, that's something that we want to talk about. Um, and it's related to... Uh, to Dr. Popiak's presence uh, at the, the uh, famous chess game between uh, Gary Kasparov and Big Blue, which then gets us into this, I, this concept of artificial intelligence and ethics. Uh, again, a perfect place for someone like Jeff who understands the technology, but also has a strong faith um, kind of base, a morality base, so uh, talk to us a, a little bit about that, Jeff. Okay, uh, first uh, correction. I think Brad Pitt was on a different magazine that same oh, week. So I, I just stand did. corrected. Okay. Two of us are cover boys. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but yeah, I guess, well, the, the, uh, the deep blue thing was, was very interesting. Uh, it was uh, computer chess championships have been going on for decades. And, uh, and there's been a really wide variety of approaches to developing chess playing programs. But uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, they had uh, Deep Thought was the name of this uh, team that some of their PhD students were developed at this incredible supercomputer that, that was able to play chess and, and beat all comers. And so they were hired by IBM and became Deep Blue. 
And in 1996, which was the 50th anniversary of the ENIAC computer, and also the 50th anniversary of the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, ACM, the ACM decided to hold their annual uh, conference in Philadelphia uh, at, uh, to coincide with the uh, ENIAC's uh, celebration. And uh, then somebody, somewhere along the line, somebody thought it'd be a great idea to have uh, Deep Blue play against the world's uh, reigning chess champion, who was Gary Kasparov, who took it very seriously and said, uh, that he, he was doing this uh, to, you know, basically uh, he was defending humanity against machines. So he, he really took this quite seriously, uh, but he, he honestly didn't have any idea at how powerful this new machine was going to be because he'd played against computers before, but they, they never measured up. Uh, the, and so the, uh, the amazing thing was that, well, I, ended up talking with Bill Macklin, uh, was the uh, a reporter for the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer who was um, covering the story, uh, and got in touch with me about a month beforehand and, and talked a little bit about it. And then he invited me to uh, attend as a, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the opening match as a member of the press. <laughs> I, I, that, that to me, the idea, of, you want to talk about one of those other places where things have really gone, uh, off as the idea of me as a member of the press, uh, <laughs> probably also quite different. I, I, sorry, I thought I had a picture of my press pass nearby. That was, uh, that, that would have been worth sharing, but the, um, actually, you know, what? I, I can stop sharing that. The, uh, uh, so, so the com com competition was, was really pretty intense. Uh, and I, uh, I was in this little room, which the press was allowed in there, but then they had to be quiet. So they left, <laughs> but I was, I was allowed in there. So I went back and stayed in while the rest of them were down, uh, in the convention hall where they had, uh, uh grand champion chess masters were giving, uh, discussion of every move and every nuance and all the different things that could go on, which was pretty interesting. But I wanted to be where the drama was. And I actually got to be in that little room with like, there were 10 people in there, Kasparov, the, the guy from Deep Blue, and the, uh, and the cameraman and, and, you know, an ACM official and three people from Kasparov's family and me. And, uh, but Kasparov was, was clearly uh, facing the, the worst, uh, standing he he had in, in any chess game probably in decades and he, he knew he was going to lose and uh just watching him uh fret and fuss and go in the back room for 10 minutes and come back and look at the board and scowl and walk off again and knew that was pretty dramatic but uh he ended up losing uh, he ended up winning the uh the entire six game match however uh but the uh, uh the the some of the fluky things that happened that were sort of uh, technical glitches uh, weren't going to happen again in the future. And a year later, they had a rematch and Deep Blue defeated him. So, uh, but that was, that was pretty interesting. And I guess that as a result of that, sometimes I get contacted by the press uh, about um, AI stuff. And this happened back in February uh, of last year when the, um, uh, Heritage Foundation issued a good 100-page report on the uh, the future of uh, impact of AI on the workforce. And actually, I'm going to switch back over and show you some uh, some more slides because this is uh, from a talk I gave to some uh, some Philadelphia school principals. Um, let me see. Well. And Jeff, I just want to uh, keep us on track. Uh, we, we've got about um, seven minutes left, and then sure. we'll be going to a close. So yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you I think what I think are the the highlights of that report. Naturally, I can't I, I managed to not share that, but uh, we'll we'll do it this time. And uh, because I th those those have uh, a pretty big like day. There's one problem that PowerPoint and Zoom each try to take over your whole screen. So uh, sometimes I end up fussing with those. Okay, I think you're seeing this. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll try to get to the high points. Uh, I said it's the Heritage Foundation, it wasn't, it was the Brookings report. But 
they, they said, actually, I think that young people, men, and underrepresented groups, particularly Hispanics and Blacks, will face pronounced difficulties as a result of automation. Um, and uh, some geographic areas are going to be hit a lot harder. Uh, and they said least susceptible are places like Washington, D.C., Bay Area, New York City, and Boston. Uh, varying levels of occupational susceptibility, they said 25% of U.S. employment uh, will have experienced high exposure to automation, et cetera. And so, Max, your shoe is ringing. And uh, so they said, but fortunately, the job tasks that are projected to be 100% automatable represent only half of 1%. So that's, that's some of the good news. And that the, the really good news is that uh, education uh, is going to um, be a, a big thing here. So. They said 6% uh, of workers with a four-year degree or more employed in jobs, but 229% uh, more susceptible if you don't have a bachelor's degree. So, uh, I don't know, then they talked about the different areas. The one I thought was kind of amusing, they said the New York, Newark and Jersey City area, in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And I can only say, what, what is Pennsylvania doing in there? They're looking to the future. They think we're going to be, you know, Jersey City is going to become part of Pennsylvania or something. Anyway, we'll, uh, I'll stop it there and just say that that was um, some of the, uh, uh, the impact of that report. But that was, that was why they, they were talking uh, with me as a result of that. Thank you. Uh, you would, just to help um, everyone understand some of the difference between how a human thinks and how a computer thinks and why this is such a, an important topic. You said at one point uh, in that uh, match with uh, Gary Kasparov that he tried a bluff and the bluff would have worked with a human opponent, but not with a computer. You want to talk about that? Yes, actually, it was uh, shortly after his, his uh, pronounced going in the back and, and uh, thinking for 10 minutes and coming back and staring at the board and going back and, and forth. And he was quite uh, upset and he made a move and the uh, opponent made a move and immediately he took his rook and <laughs> went to the other side of the board with it, a very bold, very big move. And that would have, for a human opponent, really set them back and be wondering, what did I do? What did I miss? And, and, and I think it would have been quite intimidating. Uh, on the other hand, you, know, you weren't going to be able to intimidate Deep Blue. They just saw that he made a ridiculous move and that it was, you know, and, and they won three moves later. It was, it was all over at that point. Thank you. I mean, that, if you want to say, and I'm not expecting you to, but if you want to weigh in on how when we rely on uh, artificial intelligence, on computers, that they don't necessarily get the emotional component and certainly the kinds of, of compassionate and moral pieces that um, we, we have learned. Is that even possible with a computer or can you say something about it? Yes, uh, thank you. The, um, there's been an area that's ethics and AI that has, has grown and gotten a lot of attention. And the, the problem is that when you're building a system that's going to be thinking, uh, it's not going to have quite the, uh, the, the range of, of thought capability that a human does. And um, in particular, it's very easy to uh, unintentionally uh, have gaps or omissions. So some of the things that uh, come up in, in the last few years, uh, face recognition software tends not to recognize African Americans anywhere near as well as it does Caucasians. Um, the uh, Amazon, uh, which I applaud them for announcing this, uh, I think about maybe two years ago now that uh, they were using some resume evaluation software that was going through. They get so many applicants and they really need some way of being able to go through. And they were building a system that was learning to recognize the kind of traits they wanted somebody and promote them. And then they recognized that uh, they, they were uh, disproportionately, uh, you know, not recognizing women as, as potential candidates. And it turned, it, it basically turned out that maybe the types of verbiage uh, women were using in their resumes was less aggressive than the type males were using. And that was something they had not anticipated. So they at least let people know, we were going to use this, we've been testing it, we're not going to. Of course, there's always a backlash uh, when anything like that happens. But, uh, but those types of things uh, you can easily work their way in. And so uh, there's a lot of attention being paid now to making sure that, uh, that you're not uh, doing things that have, have bias or, or adverse impacts. 
Um, I've also had my students, uh, this is something, AI classes tend to be uh, very much introductory ones, the type of thing I learned when I took this like 30 some years ago uh, because of you know, the basics and problem solving and so on. But uh, I think that in order to really have an idea of how AI is impacting society, these students need to be reading uh, some current issues and reporting on them. And so I've just built that in as part of my assignments. And the, the great thing here is the stuff I'm learning from them by the articles they're finding. Uh, the trolley problem, so they're all interested in self-driving cars. There's one thing, one area they, they really jump on. But there's this thing called the trolley problem, which I was not aware of, but people who've taken philosophy classes apparently have. But the idea is if you're a trolley operator and your trolley is, is going to crash no matter what you do, and you have to decide where to crash, which might include taking your own life as opposed to others out there. How do you make that decision? And that's really something that's, that's deeply based in, in ethics and, and morals. And, and, uh, and so if you're programming one of these self-driving cars to not address that problem is, is probably a bigger sin than however you might address it. And so uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how to handle that. Wow, that I, I, I'm familiar with with that example. Um, there, it is. It, uh, it's it's disturbing to think what possibilities there are that we're really not accounting for. So I I do want to thank you for um, starting us off. This is a new, brand new endeavor. Um, you've you've done a great job, Jeff, of of not only uh, giving us this interface be, uh, interface between uh, faith and your own vocation, uh, but you've really built some fellowship. And, and that's what the best faith formation classes, Sunday school classes, Bible studies, that's really what they are. They really do build fellowship. So as pastor, I get to learn all kinds of neat things about the people in my parishes. And I wished that people would, would get that same knowledge and be exposed to that. And this is a venue to do exactly that. So, um, so much is happening in these uh, brief, what I call, or what you would call as a professor, an academic hour of 45 to, to 50 minutes. Um, next week, uh, Don Townsend, also a tenor in the choir. Um, what is it about choir members and, and, and uh, professors? Um, but he will be joining us. He teaches at uh, St. Joseph's University. And just by the way, in June, and there was no master plan for this, just how it worked out. All of the male professors are in June and all of the female professors are in July. And we actually have more professors than we have weeks available, so we might have a second series coming up uh, sometime in the future. Um, just one question, any last minute questions? None, none that have been uh, brought over from chat. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything in closing, 30 seconds that you, you wanna give us, and uh, then we'll move on to our Arise worship service and some of you to the rest of the day. But go ahead, Jeff. Final I, I can't wait to see you all in person again. And uh, it's, it's been great. I also like to just uh, tip my hat to uh, the, the tech team and Marshall in particular who are putting together such a fabulous uh, production because as I said uh, at the beginning, maybe before this, this started, the, uh, the, I know from just doing my own Zoom sessions for my classes, how, <laughs> how easy it is to slip up and, and, and the quality of what's coming through is really uh, excellent for, for all of the, uh, uh, the, the speakers and, and you know, the camera uh, work and everything. So uh, keep on keeping on Grove and, and let's, uh, let's see each other again sometime soon. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for those words of encouragement and uh, thanks also to uh, Pastor Eva, uh, to Brenda Lewis for providing us with the tech help and for, uh, Pastor Lynn, for being my uh, behind-the-scene co-host today. Enjoy your Sunday, and we'll see you next week at 1010. God bless.